Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, as Lynn said, I'm with NEH. I run Edcitement, which is, uh, as many of you probably know, the NEH's website for K through 12 humanities teaching resources. Uh, and so yes, we offer resources in history and social studies, literature and language arts, arts and culture, and also a very small collection of foreign language resources as well. The beauty of Edcitement as a resource for teachers is that we draw on the strength of the projects that are funded through the NEH. So we're able to bring those projects into K-12 classrooms uh, and highlight them in different ways. So what I love about my job is that we really get to shine a light on the hard work that's done by other people. And I'm gonna shine a light on uh, some of those projects today and some different resources that are in conversation with uh, the project that we heard so much about this morning already, uh, and that sort of take a different uh, a different approach to some of those same themes. Uh, so Lynn mentioned earlier that we have a very long relationship between NEH and NHD since the very early contests back in the 1970s. Uh, so we we support the National History Day organization in a number of ways, uh, including at the national contest with uh, a special prize that we offer for projects that utilize the Chronicling America Historical Newspaper Database. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about Chronicling America uh, later in, in this session. Uh, we also do a series of videos each year that highlight the work of other NEH funded projects uh, and we call this Ask an NEH Expert, bringing those projects, the, the, the project directors from those teams to speak about the skills they use in their jobs, which are the same skills that your students need for their History Day research uh, and, and analysis and writing and putting all of that together into a beautiful project. One of the biggest things that we've worked on together recently is the Building a More Perfect Union lesson book. Uh, and when you come back this afternoon, you're going to get to hear from some of the teachers who uh, contributed lessons for that book. Uh, all of these lessons come at the idea of how, how is it that people, individuals and groups, have pushed the United States to be who we say we are, to bring us closer to that more perfect union uh, that we're always striving toward. Uh, so that book is out now, and you're going to hear about it more this afternoon. We actually have a second edition of that book that is coming your way uh, later, later this year in the fall. Uh, so you know, wa watch out for that. We heard a lot this morning about different ways that we can trouble this idea of a turning point. Uh, and so we, we focused in on, on that idea with thinking through uh, the Civil War and the emancipation and, and reconstruction. L let's come at that with, with a slightly different angle here. Okay. I want you to take just a minute to look at this image. Look at the, the full piece that we see here and focus in on any details that really stand out. Jot those down if you want to, but let's not, not share yet, okay? And as you would remind your students, did you scan left to right? Then did you scan right to left? Did you scan top to bottom, bottom to top? Okay, make a friend. Turn to a shoulder partner. Share what details you saw there. What's going on here? Let me give you a new piece of information as you continue those conversations. The title of this piece is Emancipation Proclamation. It was done probably in 1864, but maybe in those couple of years following, uh, by an artist who has no other known artworks. He was probably a sign maker, uh, art historians believe, working somewhere in the, in the state of New York. So take that new information. Are there new details that's, that come to you now? Great, okay, so I heard some little snippets of conversation here. Um, I would love to hear some people share with all of us what you were thinking about this painting, what details you noticed that, that speak to that idea of emancipation, uh, what, what people you see here, what events you see taking place, what, what other thoughts and questions did you have related to this piece? Yes, in the back. Yes, you. Ah, okay. Sure, yeah. What else? 
Yes, here. One more question. I was wondering about the, uh, the artist mm -hmm. itself. Is the artist white or the artist African-American? The artist is white, yeah. Okay. Oh, in the very back. I'm. I hadn't read that as a statue. That's interesting. Well, now maybe I do. What else do we see going on here? Well, that was definitely the African Americans are waiting for are marching out, are coming out to emancipation Lincoln as the Northern Army is coming to them, is marching in victory. Bringing it to them. Bringing yeah. Okay, yeah, great. Uh, back here. So one of the things as a, you're looking at artwork, um, it is almost perfectly divided. Mm. Light on the left, dark on mm. the right. She's perfectly in the middle. You see light on the top, dark, agricultural, more towards the bottom. You see weapons and upright and all facing one direction. You see kneeling on the, on the ground, you know, hands outstretched, reaching towards something the other is very statuesque. Okay, any other thoughts on this, general impressions? So we know that our artist, A.A. A. Lamb, was a white man. Who do you imagine was the intended audience for this painting? Is this something that Lamb painted for other white people? Did he, who, did, who did he paint this for? Who is he hoping is going to see this? Oh, 1864. And the war during this 1864 election, Lincoln was fully anticipated to lose. Sure. And that this would be stay the course, mm -hmm. to keep the country together, look what Lincoln is doing at the day. So I kept looking at the torch, wondering why it had been lit, but if they, you know, when you come back to Rome, you come back to the Capitol when the mission is done, and emancipation is what is going to get us there. He's got it out, the cherry has emancipation on it. Everything is almost done. Some great details y'all are picking out here. Um, so this piece is part of our teacher's guide on arts of the Afro-Atlantic diaspora, uh, which is a project that we worked on in collaboration with the National Gallery of Art uh, for their Afro-Atlantic Histories exhibition uh, that went up last summer. Uh, and so that, that exhibition and our teacher's guide features a variety of artworks ranging from the 17th century to present day that all highlight different aspects of the continuing legacies of the, uh, of the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, and so in our teacher's guide, that link works, and you'll get these slides later. Um, you're, you're gonna find some, some guiding questions, some framing text to be able to think through these issues, uh, some lesson plans to, uh, to bring some of these artworks into your classroom, some virtual galleries with just some background information on a number of other artworks, uh, and some strategies for using visual arts in your social studies classroom. Uh, to be able to bring those in, not only to open up discussions and issues, but also to bring those in as a part of the historical record uh, to, to support the other things that you're discussing in class. Okay, so coming back to th this uh, idea of, of reconstruction, troubling the notion of, of whether or not that the, those decades there uh, surrounding the Civil War are a turning point. Uh, I want to point you toward a, a brand new teacher's guide that uh, is hot off the presses, if you can say that something is hot off the presses if it's on a website, uh, Rethinking Reconstruction, uh, which is about black community and political organizing. This guide highlights the work of the Color Conventions Project and adds some other perspective to that Color Conventions movement, uh, always with the notion uh, contrary to what we just saw in that, that painting, that emancipation, that abolition, that this, this was something that was secured by black people for themselves, right? Uh, not something that, that was gifted uh, from, by, by the Union Army coming in. Uh, so this, this guide is going to have 
again, some of the, the resources that you've looked at uh, from our colleagues from the Color Conventions Project, highlighting some of the resources in their archives, and then pairing those with other projects uh, that are in, uh, in conversation with uh, their archives. For example, pairing it with uh, some of the resources from Chronicling America. So we are going to look at the uh, convention that was in 1865 in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, and so we're in August of 1865. Where is this in our reconstruction timeline? Is this early? Is it late? Is it like it's pretty early, right? I mean, it depends on exactly where you want to want to pinpoint the beginning of Reconstruction, but this is early uh, in the game of Reconstruction, certainly just following uh, the uh, the end of the war uh, by by just a couple of months. So, as uh, as our colleagues mentioned, one of the beautiful resources that you can find in their archives is these convention proceedings. Uh, but the, there is the printed PDF page by page of these booklets and what they actually looked like so that you can get a sense of, wh of what this paper document was uh, that came out of these events. Uh, and then, of course, with uh, transcriptions, that, that's much easier to read. Uh, so if you were doing this in your classroom, you would probably pull apart some pieces from the, from the proceedings in the archive. Uh, you might pull apart just one day of the convention. You might pull apart uh, a couple of different themes that are hit on by, by different speeches, and in any number of ways that you could do it. Um, in the interest of time for us, the main points of these four days that you would find in these proceedings are the idea of uh, the ballot box and the jury box the need for quality teachers and education opportunities for black children, and the expansion of the Freedmen's Bureau, uh, wage protections for black laborers, and a, a lot of discussion around black men's military service uh, as, a, as a justification for suffrage. So these proceedings are on, on the website for the Color Conventions Project. Also, as mentioned, they appear in many newspapers, particularly within the black press. Uh, often, you'll find the entire proceedings printed within, within the newspaper, uh, certainly summaries of different days and highlights from different speeches. The Colored Tennessean is one of the black newspapers that carried the convention proceedings from that 1865 convention the, that we talked about earlier. This is not the proceedings from the convention. This is a piece that was also in the newspaper on the day that they, they covered the convention, okay? Which was on August 12th uh, of 1865, so just a couple days after the close of the convention. One of the things that pairing the Color Conventions Project archives with Chronicling America can help you do is to get some more context uh, to see what were the other conversations that were happening around these conventions. How were those, those conversations participating within the convention, even though they weren't maybe in the, in the settings, in the proceedings themselves? OK, so as I mentioned, this appears in the, the Colored Tennessean on the same day that they published the proceedings. Uh, you're go also going to find in that issue advertisements for rooms to rent out. You're going to find evidence of other people who are surrounding the convention itself. Certainly a lot of the information on the Color Conventions Project and some of their exhibits point to this very fact. Uh, and you can find it in these newspapers when you, when you dig into them. I want to show you one other thing that was published in this same edition. Can everyone read that? So we have Samuel Dove who's seeking his family members from whom he's been separated uh, by this institution of slavery. Uh, and there are at least four other such information wanted ads within this very edition of the newspaper. This is a huge phenomenon. Uh, and, and something that's, uh, that's really interesting for us to consider as uh, people voicing their own petitions, right? Seeking, the, seeking their family, seeking their loved ones, wanting to bring those connections back. Um, 
I think it's very interesting also and in, to put this in conversation in your history classroom, perhaps with fugitive slave ads. I want to draw your attention to another uh, NEH resource, uh, which is Last Seen, uh, Finding Family After Slavery. This is uh, an incredible archive of these ads uh, and some, some context to bring those different ads together to, to map out uh, where these ads are, are represented throughout the country. Uh, it's also a really cool opportunity for your students to help transcribe some of these ads if you want to have your kids dig into doing that kind of digital history work. Uh, the, the current uh, funding that, that NEH is offering for this project is to bring together 10 different people within a narrative uh, based on all of these different ads and how those ads are related uh, and, and how their stories uh, interact uh, with one another. So that's one more thing that I would encourage you to check out. Thank you for hanging out with me for this sort of uh, second act of, of this morning's activities. Um, I encourage you to go, go back to Excitement for these resources and all kinds of other stuff, uh, things that will help you explore turning points with your kids or teach all kinds of different things. Um, Many of you probably are interested in our summer professional development programs, both our landmarks and our institutes programs. Those new programs for next summer will be announced on Excitement as well as on the main NEH page in November. So be sure to watch for those. I can't say anything until they're officially funded, but I think you're going to be excited about some of the offerings um, next year.